It's out there. Waiting for you. Watching you. Hunting you. Looking for the right moment to strike. Are you afraid? Do you feel your heart start beating faster and faster? It encompasses all of your fears. It knows all of your weaknesses. It is all of your faults. You may want to flee from it, but it is not going anywhere. There is no turning back. The battle must be fought. A battle that seems so unwinnable, hopeless, unstoppable. But it must be stopped. The battle is here. It's time to face it. It's time. To slay your dragon. All right, all right. I hope you're ready, because I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready to slay some dragons. Hey, here's what you know by week two of this series. First, that dragons are just a metaphor. They're not really real, guys, okay? They're a metaphor for some things in our life. Habits, hang-ups, sin cycles, sin patterns, addictions, toxic relationships that affect us emotionally, spiritually, mentally, every which way in our life. These things are bullying us. They're pushing us around and they're saying, you know what? This is who you are. This is what your life is going to be about. And here's the thing that we realize is that number two, we cannot fully thrive. We will not fully thrive in this life if we don't slay our dragons. But here's the good news. The good news is that we've seen since week one, as we looked at the life of Gideon, that God says, hey, I am for you in this. Gideon was down in a hole and God called him up. The angel of the Lord came to him and said, you're a hero. You're not a zero. You may think that you're a zero, but you are a hero. And through my power and your action, your obedience, we are gonna slay this dragon in your life. And for him, it was fear, it was insecurity, it was all of these things in his head. It was manifest, two in the nation of Israel. If you didn't hear it week one, go back and listen to that. Week two, we realize, okay, it's one thing to believe that God's for me. It's one thing to believe that God's power and my action in that is going to slay this dragon. It's another thing to stop making excuses about why this dragon is in my life and stop saying I'm a victim to it and stop saying, okay, it's somebody else's fault. It's their fault. It's whatever. We say, no, I'm staking my claim and I'm gonna go with God and I'm gonna do whatever it takes with his power, with his direction to slay this dragon. Well, today we're gonna answer a very important question. We're gonna do some heavy lifting today. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you this. What we're gonna talk about today, you will resist. It will be uncomfortable for you. It will start getting in your head and getting in your stuff and you will not want to move in this. So here's what we're gonna do. We're all gonna pray for each other, and I'm serious about this, okay? So I want you to stand up. I want you to say, everybody just stand up right now. And here's what I want you to do. You don't have to literally put your hand on the, on the, on the person in front of you, because that's weird, and they'll be like, whoa, 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 I don't know you, okay? But in any way you want, I just want you to hold your hand out. And look, if you're a guest here today, we don't normally do this. We probably should normally do this, but we're gonna do this today. I just want you to just, either one hand or two hand, just lay it like as if you're praying for the person in front of you. If you're in the front row, pray for each other, okay? Pray for each other. And I want to lead us in this prayer right now, okay? So we're, we're just gonna lay our hands out as if we're praying for the person. We don't even know their name, maybe. And here's what I want you to pray for them. I want you to pray against distraction right now. Just go ahead. Even if you don't pray, even if you don't believe in God, you just pray for them right now in your own, it can be silently, it can be out loud. Just pray for them right now. I wanna pray for for, uh, against distraction right now. Pray for that person right now. Pray against shame. Shame, pray against that right now. Just say, God, uh, when, when the enemy of, of, of their heart and, and, and their flesh want to feel shame and want to hide those things, God, give them the courage right now not to give in to shame. You just pray that for them right now. Just, just say, no shame in this place today. No pride, just pray against pride that pride would not have a place in this room today. 
that there would be no pride, that, that there'd be no fear, no fear of man, no fear of exposure, that today that people, the person in front of you, that, that if there is something that they need to get free from today, a good thing even, that be, has become a God thing, that today that they would have the courage to respond and do that. You just pray that for them right now. Father, right now I pray for this room. I pray for every man and woman, every college student, every retired person, anybody in between, Father, every life phase. I pray right now that you would reveal to us how we can live in freedom how we can live and thrive, Father. I know that today is going to be heavy for so many people. And so right now, I just pray that your spirit would move in this place and move out any strongholds, any distractions, anything that our spiritual enemy would wanna put in the way. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Okay, hey, stand up, keep standing up. I want you to say to some people around you, hi, my name is, tell them your name, and just say, I'm gonna pray for you this week. Go ahead, just go ahead and promise them that. I'm gonna pray for you this week. Because man, it's gonna be a tough one. It's gonna hurt so good. I'm gonna pray for you this week, Rick. All right. Woo, man. That's what the church does. That's what we do, we pray for each other. We may not even know each other, but we're gonna pray for each other. All right, turn to Judges chapter six. If we don't slay our dragons, we will never fully thrive. I wanna answer a question today, and it's a question I think we all have to answer. Have you ever wondered where certain stuff comes from? And then you Google it, or you search it out, and you're like, oh, I wish I didn't know. I'll give you an example. Uh, Chicken McNuggets, don't ever research that. Because chicken, well, it's up for grabs as an adjective on that thing, okay? I mean, that's, a, that's some crazy stuff. Uh, you ever wonder uh, where stink bugs come from? Well, it comes from the same place most of the stuff in your house comes from, China. <laughs> Guys, that's a funny joke, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, they came over in cargo ships decades ago, and now they have invaded uh, all of our homes. Uh, like, these things, it's like, where in the world did these come from? Like, I grew up, and I never saw a stink bug, and now they're everywhere, Today, I wanna ask a question and I wanna answer a question together, okay? Where do dragons come from? Where do dragons come from? And I'm talking about the metaphorical dragons that are our hangups and our habits. You guys know what I'm saying. Those things in our life, those patterns, those cycles, those things that keep us from fully thriving in this life. Those things that keep us religious but not thriving in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those things that keep us judgmental and having superiority complexes that keep us narcissistic, that keep us proud, that keep us in fear, that keep us in anxiety, those things. Relationally, emotionally, spiritually, those things. Where do they come from? Now, there is a pat answer that many of us want to give, especially when we're judging other people, okay? And I wanted to look at this. Let's look at verse one of Judges chapter six, verse one. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. Remember that from week one. Why in the world did the Midianites come and invade them and bully them and and suppress them or oppress them? It says, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. The first thing that we think when somebody, and we see a dragon in somebody's life is, We think dragons come from our choices, right? We have a friend who's a functional alcoholic. Just stop drinking so much. That's that's our advice to them, right? Just stop making that choice. Just stop looking at pornography. Just stop it. Just stop making that choice. These are the pat things that we say to each other because we're all well-intentioned and well, like we can figure out other people's problems and how they can slay their dragons. Just stop making those choices. Just stop walking into your job like you are. Just stop talking to that person. Just stop, stop making those choices. And if we were to go back in time to Israel and we were to go house by house to say, hey guys, just stop doing evil in the sight of the Lord. It's that easy. Just stop, right? Wrong. And that's what we're gonna see today. That when we 
narrow this thing down to just our choices or somebody else's choices. Man, shame and condemnation move in. What is behind those choices? That's what we really have to grapple with. Why is it that we make these choices that cause us to lock ourselves in our house for 16 hours a day playing Fortnite or Halo? Like, where does that come from? Just stop. No, 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 no. There's something deeper there. there there's something going on there that's, that's causing those choices. And for us to walk up to somebody or to a group of people and just say, hey, man, why don't you just stop doing that? We are only dealing with the symptoms. We're only dealing with the choices that we make or someone else makes. Let's jump into the story and we'll figure this out together. Verse 25, that night, what night? The night that Gideon, if you were in week two, he already staked his claim, he built an altar to the Lord, and he said, okay, I'm all in, God, we're gonna take care of business. I'm gonna walk through your power and your provision and your purpose, and I'm gonna take action, and I'm gonna do whatever you want me to do. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, okay, well, let's do it. If you just said you're gonna do whatever I, I ask you to do, here's what I want you to want. I want you to take the second bull from your father's herd. I want you to go take your dad's property, the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar to Baal. I want you to go to your father's altar and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Now, here's what we have to know about Israel and these false gods, Baal and Asherah. Baal and Asherah were the worship of progress, fertility, and sexuality. Sound pretty familiar, doesn't it? Progress, fertility, and sexuality. What would happen to a culture that worshiped progress, fertility, and sexuality? Hmm, I don't know. Wonder what those people were up to those days. Then, build an altar to the Lord your God here on the hilltop sanctuary. What does that show us? It shows us that Gideon's thinking was very much what his father's thinking was up until that moment. Hey, it's pretty okay that we have a altar to the one true God while we also have an altar to Baal and Asherah. You see, God, we just think there are some things you can't really do for us. There are some things that we thought you might, you know, carry for us, but really don't, and we've kind of lost faith in who you are, so it's not that we're throwing you out wholesale, it's just that there are some other things that need enhancement in our life, and we do the same thing. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the Lord, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord commanded, but he did it at night because he was afraid. We're gonna come back to that. He was afraid. We're gonna come back to that. He was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. What's going on here? The people of Israel still believe that God exists. They still believe that he has given them what he's given them, the land. But they have lost faith in his ability to provide for them. He's, they, have, they have a skewed view of who God is. They have a failing view of who God is. And so as a result, they said, we need some idols. I wanna demonstrate it like this. This is my idol. Yes, it's your idol. It's shiny and it's pretty and it, it is pleasing to the eye. What can our idols be that we worship in place of or in parallel with God? How about our job? Can't we worship our job? Wow, when I go to work, I feel so competent. I feel so purposeful. I feel, and then our job starts becoming this thing that we give our devotion and our attention and our, all of those things that we once gave to the one true God who rescued and redeemed us. How about things like food 
Oh, I just got into some stuff. Yeah, how often do we make food, something that is to sustain our life and give us energy, a God? Oh, give me, I need more. How about money? How about money? Oh, man, you know what, God, you can have all these things in my life, and man, I'm gonna go to church, and man, I'm gonna sing some songs, and I'm gonna pray, but I, the money is mine. I'm, I'm gonna keep the money, the money. I'm gonna spend the money how I wanna spend the money. How about, oh, here we go. How about our kids? Can they become little idols to us? Oh, we gotta make sure that little Joey and, and little Sally have everything that they need. And oh, little Joey and little Sally, do you need this? Okay, okay. Oh, little Joey and Sally, they need to be the best because we need, because when they're the best, then people will think we're the best. And oh my goodness, oh, can we make good things, God things? I'll give you an example in my own life. A few months ago, I said to my wife, hey, why is it that our daughter wants to talk to you all the time? She doesn't want to talk to me that much. She says, let me get back to you on that. I come back to her a little bit later and I said, hey, how come you and I aren't laughing as much? How come we're not talking as much as we normally do? She goes, hey, you remember that conversation I wanted to get back to? Let's have that right now. Look, you're already feeling a little nervous for my conversation. <laughs> you're like, oh man, this is awkward. Yeah, so I asked her if I could share this. So she sat down with me and, and she, says, she, says, she says, here's what I've noticed whenever you're around our daughter and me and sometimes even the whole family. When there's a lull in the conversation, when you get bored with it, you go to your phone and you read. You read, you read books, you read this. And then when we're in the car, instead of just chit-chatting with the rest of the family, you start listening to a podcast or you start listening to music and you start distracting yourself. She says, I want you to know, we've even talked about it with you doing it and you didn't even know we were talking about you. You guys were talking behind my back? No, we were talking in front of your face. <laughs> she says, you've gotten really distracted. Translation. I had become a content junkie. I wanted to fill my mind. I wanted to stimulate myself with new ideas or distractions or entertainment. And as a result, I was not engaging in the real life relationships in front of me. Now, I know that's just my problem. So thank you for letting me have therapy with you guys. That is sarcasm. This is a problem. This is a problem in our culture and our society. There are things, good things, that have become God things in our life that take our devotion, that take our affection and our attention away from our worship of God, where we would be willing and able to say every day, God, whatever you want me to do, there is nothing that would keep me from doing, saying, thinking, acting, whatever it is that you want. Why? Because I am in tune with you. My affection, my attention, my devotion, my dependency is on you. Not this job, not what my kids think of me, not what this is, not what that is, but you. I wonder, what are the idols in your life? What is it that medicates your pain? What is it that keeps you distracted? What is it that you know has become something shiny and pretty in your life that keeps you from going all in and all out in what God wants you to do. And there was Gideon saying, you know what, God, I get it. What you're saying to me and me pulling these altars down and building one to you on top of it is these two cannot coexist for me to be all in. These two cannot coexist for me to be all in. I have to either tear something down or I have to take it down many notches. I have to tear something down or I have to take it down many notches in our life, my life because it has become 
a God to me. It has become an idol. So what happens? Look at verse 29. The people said to each other, who did this? Who did this? And after asking around and making careful search, they learned that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash. We, he must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. How dare he mess with our idol? But Joash shouted to the mob that confronted him, why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his, his case will be put to death by mourning. If Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down the altar. I'm gonna tell you something today. Some of you are gonna do business with God and you're going to tear down some altars today that have kept you in a position of being stalled in your relationship with God, a place where shame has replaced power, a place where secrets has replaced light in your life. You are gonna make some decisions. And as a result of those decisions, you are going to remove some things in your life or you are going to take them and put them in the proper place in your life. And I will promise you this, when you do that, it will affect other people and some will not be happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey man, why don't you come drink with us? You know what? I find that I don't just drink one, I drink four. And so I'm not going to be able to come to the cookout if that's what's gonna be there. Oh, okay. I guess you got religion, man. I guess you got, I mean, all right, yeah, whatever, man, whatever. I don't know that we're happy with you anymore. I don't know that we're gonna invite you anymore. I'm gonna tell you something. You're gonna make some decisions today to remove some things from your life and not everybody's gonna be for you. Some people are gonna show up at your dad's house and say, what the heck's going on with him? What the heck's going on with her? There are gonna be some things in your life that you remove some radical things. Hey, why did you go from an iPhone to a flip phone? Because it was a distraction, because it was a portal into other things in my life that bring a lot of destruction in my life. Man, that's weird. No, it may seem weird, but I value my family and I value what God wants for me more than having my email at access every 30 seconds. Yeah, I knew nobody was shouting on that one. I knew that this would be that message where it'd be really hard to clap. I knew this would be that message where we would start to squirm and we'd start to say, man, y'all pray for me because this one's gonna be hard because there are some things in our life that we just don't want to get rid of. We just don't. I'm a 42-year-old man, and I have my iPhone and my iPad locked up like I'm nine years old. Yeah, I have to go to my wife sometimes and say, hey, can you unlock this website? You say, really? Like, are you that weak? I just know what my dragons are. I just do. I just do. Some would say, oh man, you're weak, and here's what I would say back to them. You know what? That might be true, but I value my mind and my heart and the intimacy with my wife enough to know what I was exposed to as a kid, as a teenager, as a young adult could destroy me. And if that just means I have to go like a nine-year-old and say, hey, can you unlock this? I would rather take that than having unfettered, unaccountable access to something that could destroy me. Now, you may be strong enough. You may be strong enough to travel alone. I, I don't travel alone. I, I take someone, hey, one of my kids, my wife, somebody from our church, hey, just travel with me. I don't wanna be alone. 
So what's the deal with that? I just know what my dragons are. And I think some of you just need today just to speak them. And you've been afraid to say it. You've been afraid to say, okay, I've worshiped my job. Because you know what that means by saying it. It means you gotta remove some things from your job. It means you gotta maybe put your job at a different place. Hey, I am addicted to alcohol. I'm, I am drinking too much. I am addicted to success. I am addicted to this. I am judgmental. I am fill in the blank. And you start to realize that the choices that you're making are really backed up by an idol that you're worshiping. And that's what Gideon is facing right here. From then on, Gideon was called Jeroboam, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. Can you imagine if you got so serious about slaying this dragon and tear down this altar that people actually changed your name? Can you imagine that? Yeah, my dad used to be really angry and he used to yell at us all the time. But wow, my dad is gentle and humble now. Oh, come on. What else? Oh, my mom used to be so fearful and anxious, hovering over us like a mother hen. I couldn't even breathe without getting permission from her. She was just so afraid, dot, dot, dot. Now she lives in so much freedom. She is so much more peaceful and joyful in her life now. What happened? She stopped seeing us as an idol. And she just started seeing us as her children, gifts that God had given her to take care of and let go. Can you imagine if you slayed something? Yeah, Uncle Jim the drunk is now Uncle Jim the generous, life-giving, peacemaking, uncle who everybody wants to hear his story of how he overcame these things. Doug, the porn act, is now the man seeking after sexual integrity and helping other people get freedom themselves. Can you imagine if they change your name? Sally, the girl so wrapped up in her image, so wrapped up in what people thought of her, is now somebody who walks with strength, who walks with confidence because it comes from something more than what she wears and what people look at her and say about her. They would change your name because you would do business today and you would remove some things from your life or you would move them down in a place where they are properly perspective in your life. I think some of you are ready to do that. I think some of you are ready to join some of the people from the first service who are ready to say, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll turn in my two weeks notice. I'll walk across the cul-de-sac. I'll do whatever it takes. I will confess this thing. I will smash my phone. I will do whatever it takes because this idol has become in parallel or in place of God, that you would be willing to do what Gideon did that day, that you would be willing to pick up a hammer and say, I'll do whatever it takes. And you say, well, how in the world am I gonna get the courage to do that? Listen to what the apostle Paul says in, in, in Colossians chapter two, verse 13. He says, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Your sinful nature kept drawing you back to these things that took the place of God. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. Listen, there's something that we need more than food. We need forgiveness. We need forgiveness. We need our conscience cleaned by God to say, listen, it isn't anything you can do for me, anything you can do for yourself. It's what I've already done for you. It is forgiven. You can walk in peace, you can walk in joy, you can walk in freedom because of Christ. He canceled the record 
of the, ch- of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Do you get what he just said? When Jesus hung on the cross for your forgiveness, my forgiveness, eternal forgiveness, all those idols in our life that want to enslave us, that want to influence our choices, that create dragons in our life, Jesus says, my death on a cross put all of that to shame. There is nothing that will replace the power and the love of God in your life. You don't have to put anything in front of it. I promise you that God will take care of it. And you can do what Gideon did that day. And he killed. And he smashed the idol. You can do that today through the power of Jesus Christ, death and resurrection. That is your inheritance, Brentwood Church. That is who you are. Nothing, nothing can stand in the way of that. Slaying our dragons requires us to smash the idols that created them. Today, some of you believed and followed Jesus for years for even decades, for seasons of your life. And you've gone all in with Jesus in some areas of your life, but there's still this thing that you've put either in parallel or in place of your total devotion to God. And maybe on the surface, most people would say, hey, that's a, that's a good thing, but that good thing has become a God thing. And you know that God has been pressing on you and pressing on you and pressing on you, not because he shames you, not because he blames you, but because he loves you and he wants you to live and thrive in all that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die and to resurrect from the dead to give you. And today is the day that you stop denying it and justifying it that you stop blaming and you stop shaming and instead you get free. You get free. I talked to a man recently. He said, I drank all the time and for 10 years, 10 years I was clean and sober. And then he said there, something happened in his life and he just thought, you know what? I think I wanna drink. And he drank. And he drank, and he kept on drinking. And he said, I need to do whatever it takes to remove this from my life. And I prayed with this man in that moment, and I said, what are you willing to do? He says, I'm willing to get rid of it all. I'm willing to get rid of it all. And you know what, maybe that's not your thing. Maybe maybe that's not your idol. I, I don't know, maybe it is. Maybe it's a job, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's of eating disorder. Maybe it's a memory in your life that you've just chosen that that's who you are and you keep going back to it and you keep going back to it. I wanna invite you today to step into what God has empowered you to do. If you will just take action I believe that he's saying to you and he's saying to me the same thing that he said to Gideon. Tear it down and in its place, go all in with me all over again. Give your adoration and your attention and your devotion and your dependency to me and to me alone. And I promise you, any of those things that you think I won't take care of, I will take care of and then some. Any of those things that you're worried about, I will, ev- I will ev- replace those things and I will replace them tenfold with what you think you're missing. Two things. Number one, let God show you what you're worshiping in parallel or in place of him. Today. Today. Let God show you that. 
Would you be willing in just this moment, just to, even as I'm speaking, just to speak to the Lord and just say, God, man, it's been a while since I've come to you this raw before because I've been so afraid of what you might say to me. But I'm tired, I'm tired of running from you. Today, God, what is it in my life that you want me to remove or that you want me to move into a different place? And then finally, would you smash that? Would you smash that idol? You know, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's your image. Maybe it's a distraction. Maybe it's a device. I don't know. But would you be willing today to say, I will smash this thing. I am not going to let this thing keep me held back and keep me from thriving anymore. I want to invite some of you, though, to take an extra step in this. Some of you are not winning today in sexual integrity. And I don't know what that means to you, but you know what that means to you. And I wanna invite you to be a part of something that we're launching in this fall. Proven men and proven women, you can sign up for these environments. These are people who might be winning and wanna continue to win in sexual integrity or people who are not winning in sexual integrity. And if that's you today, I want you to know we have that link in our app and you can go to that anytime today and you can sign up for one of these groups. I wanna invite you to do that. That might be you taking the step to killing this idol in your life. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes though in this, in this moment. Here's what I wanna say to you. Today, I think some of you, you just need prayer. You need this church to get around you right now. You need some men and women who have been affirmed, who are safe, if you will, for you to just be able to speak today what so many people have come forward to speak and just say, this is an idol in my life and I need, I need to stop hiding it. And just by saying it, just by saying I'm worshiping my job, I'm worshiping this substance, I'm worshiping this medication, I'm worshiping this relationship, I'm worshiping this role in my life. Just by saying it, you begin to take the power away from it. And maybe that's what you need to do today. Maybe you came with a person and that person is right beside you and you just wanna just look over to them today as we begin to sing and just say, hey, I need to, I, need, I just need you to pray for me. And here it is. This is a place for you to confess sin, to confess strongholds and take the power away from them. And so when we begin to sing, when we begin to respond, I'm gonna invite you just to come down here and pray with one of our elders, pray uh, with one of our care and response team members as you are being led by God. His power, your action. As always, our response stations are gonna be open, but here's the deal. With your eyes closed and your head bowed in this sacred space, I just want you to pray right now for the person here in this room who has not yet believed and followed Jesus. And if that's you today, I wanna, I wanna speak into your situation for a second. I think that you're here today and you're ready to make the most important decision of your life and you know that this is the moment. I'm gonna count to three. And on three, I want you to raise your hand and I want you just to say, today, that is me. I want to take the step to believe and follow Jesus Christ. You just raise your hand boldly when I count to three. One, right now in this moment, you acknowledge that God is your heavenly father. And where you may have had an imperfect earthly father, he is your perfect heavenly father and he has made you and he has saved you and he wants to transform you. You just tell him that right now. Thank you, God, for being my father. And today, today I let you into my mind, into my heart. Two, right now, I want you just to acknowledge what you already know to be true, what has been clear to you and has made, been made clear to you today, and that is that Jesus Christ is God's son and that he hung on a cross to put to shame all of the sin, the death, and the evil in your life, to put it to shame, to conquer it for you, to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And right now in this moment, you just speak that. You say, I believe 
that Jesus is God's son and that he is salvation from all my sins. And today I accept eternal forgiveness. And in this moment, welcome the Holy Spirit of God into your heart and into your mind to be your guide, to be your sustainer, to be the one who gives you courage and strength. So one, your heavenly Father loves you. Two, Jesus Christ died for your sins, past, present, and future. His Holy Spirit is now in you. And three, I want you to raise your hand right now and just boldly say today, today was the day I made the decision to believe and follow Jesus Christ. Right now, just raise your hand. I just wanna see that, I just wanna see that. Just raise your hand right now. I see that. Anyone else? Just raise your hand boldly in this moment. All right. Would you stand with me and would you celebrate one more person today in this service? Yes. From death to life. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want you to celebrate that in the first service, another one of our brothers and sisters crossed that threshold. That is the power of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's what I wanna say. We've, we've covered some heavy things today, some very personal things today. And I know, I know that if you need help in praying through some things, there's gonna be a part of you that just like the people in Gideon's neighborhood, they're not gonna be happy and you're afraid of what people might think. I'm just gonna say today, don't let the fear of man, don't let the approval of someone who came with you, don't let whatever, don't let any of that stuff keep you from walking down here and saying, today, I need prayer. I need to smash some idols. And here it is, would you pray for me? You walk down here as soon as we start as soon as we start to sing, you just, you just walk down there or you turn to the person beside you or you get to your knees and you just do business with God and you walk out of here in freedom for what Christ has brought to you through the cross and through his resurrection and thrive again, thrive again like you once did. Thrive again in your prayer life where your prayer life and your faith will move mountains because there's nothing in the way anymore where when you sing these songs, they don't hit the ceiling and come back and create cynicism or boredom for you. But man, they fly through that ceiling up to the heavens and they are a shout of praise to God because of the victory that he has brought to you in your life. And today, and today, it may just be as simple as saying, I can't let this thing be an idol in my life anymore. I confess it today. I smash it today. And you'll be obedient to that. Let's sing, let's respond. And let's go change this world, Brentwood Church.